I'm going to be demonstrating a portrait in colored pencil and blending with powder blender. If you are new to Powder Blender and you want to know more about it, I do have an intro to Powder Blender video. Make sure to check that out first. In that project, I walk you through step by step when you should stop and spray versus blending, when to use the Powder Blender and all of that. So it's a really good way to get started. For this project, this one is quite a bit more advanced. This project was a lot of fun. There was an entire team involved in getting the photo that I used for the reference. My friend Jimmy designed the dress that was used in this. He was going for a Beetlejuice inspired theme. And so I wanted to take the photos and I'll have a list of the names of the photographers, the hairstylist, the makeup artist. There's just so many people who are involved. I'll have a link to them and their Instagram below in the video description along with their names here or here. I don't know which side I'm putting that on. But I wanted to take this a step further into the whole Beetlejuice theme and that's why she has green hair. It, it wouldn't make sense, I guess, if you didn't know that. And if you want to draw this same photo for your own practice, I will have a link to where you can get that from the photographer. You just need to make sure that you credit the entire team involved anywhere where you post that photo online. If you are supporters over on Patreon, make sure to head over where I've got two parts to this tutorial, over three and a half hours of footage. So much, much slower than what you're going to see here. If you are unfamiliar with Patreon for as little as $4 a month, you get access to all of my one to two hour long tutorials. I upload a new one every single week. I've got over 150 of them there for you to watch now. If you're not already a patron, you can head over and check out my video library. And I've made one of my Patreon videos, my Margate and colored pencil, that is free for you to watch now. So you may as well go check that out anyway. For this, I am working on Fisher 400 sanded paper, and this part's going extra fast. You can watch this in the live stream if you want to see this happening, well, in real time. So with this section, I'm just really, really loosely going over everything. And you can see it can be super sloppy. I'm holding the pencil to the side so that I've got more surface area covering that sanded paper. And all of these scribble lines that you're seeing, once I blend it out with powder blender, you're not going to see them at all. So I went ahead and got everything on there. Let's go ahead and blend out. I'm using a soft tool blending brush along with a little bit of that powder blender on there. A little bit of powder blender goes a very long way. And just smudging all of that out. Being that this was only part one of the two part Patreon tutorial, there's only the halfway finished paint photo off to the side here. But you can see what my goal is on that background. I wanna get it really, really dark. But these first few layers are not going to be that dark. If I keep adding pencil and adding pencil and blending with powder blender, it's really gonna to get to the point where I'm just knocking the product off or the pencil off the paper. It's not really going to get much darker. So what I'm going to do once this is all blended out, I will take my texture fixative and spray that. Now I was too close, you can see that, like I really went too close with that spray on there and so I got these heavy droplets. That is really common with this product. It's not a defect in the can if that happens to you. It's one of a couple of reasons. One, it can be that your can wasn't shaken up all of the way. You really have to, to shake that up very, very well for like two minutes for it to, to work well. The other is that the nozzle can actually start to clog. If that starts to happen, just pull it off the can and soak in hot water for a few minutes or 20 minutes however long and then dry it off and put it back the other i found is if i push too hard on the nozzle i push it all the way down i'm more likely to have it come out too fast or if i just have the can too close to the paper that will happen luckily when it does happen it doesn't ruin anything as you can see when i go over it no problem and i let it dry for about five to ten minutes before i go on to my next layer and this is all really just so fast. That's what I like about using this product. I'm working on a 16 by 20 inch paper and this size with colored pencil would have taken me a whole lot longer to get this kind of coverage. So I love being able to fill in a lot very quickly. The other thing that's really nice, and you'll see this, especially once I get into the hair, when you're working on t paper that has this much, much texture, the pencils, you can see all of the little strands of hair really, really easily when you draw them back in. When you're working on watercolor paper, it gets to where there's just not that much tooth left to the paper after you've done a few layers. And so it makes it really hard to get those final strands to show up sometimes. You can also, with Powder Blender, I'm working on sanded paper, another option, which I'm probably going to give a, a few more tries to to really see if I like it. I've done it a few times, but I'm lazy and I don't like to prep my paper before. I airbrush on my regular watercolor paper, a hot press watercolor paper, I airbrush the the gesso on it. I thin it out with some water and then airbrushed it, and that worked really well. I've 
been using sanded paper for so long now that I'm going to try the gessoed paper again and see how I feel about it now that I've used this for so many times in a row. You can see every single time after I blend with the powder blender, that's what you're seeing me blend with with that little stick with the sponge on the end there with the blue handle. Every single time I'm going to spray that off with my texture fixative between layers. That seals that down. Now it doesn't seal it down so that, I mean, if I touch it a little bit will come off on my fingers, but not like how it does if you have not sprayed it. So here I'm missing the clip of working on the black and white portion of her hair. So we're just going to skip ahead to the brown side. And the black and white section isn't done. I'm going to end up adding green to that later on. And I just want to start building up the clumps and clusters of her hair. One of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're drawing hair, and this also, I believe, was a part of the live stream. But one of the biggest mistakes that people will often make is that they try to create the, the hair so it goes in an even line from top all the way down and like one long strand and that's not going to look realistic what you want to do is work in clumps and clusters look at the finished hair there how it's lights and dark shadows it's not so much with the individual strands now at the end once i've got her clothing on and her face drawn in that is going i will go back through and add some individual strands but there's not that many think of abstract shapes clumps and clusters really look at your reference photo and figure out from there what shapes you need what highlights what shadows look think of it that way more than individual strands of hair And I'll have cards pop up for all of the live streams. So if you want to check those portions out in real time, you can do that. And see how I put in the gold color. Now I'm coming back through with that brown. Now that gold color is not the color of her hair at all. When you look at that, you would think, wow, that's way too kind of red, way too, or, you know, orangey, too light. I need that for the highlights. Most of that won't show through in the end. And the nice thing with this too, well, there's a few things. First, you can see my pencils are not very sharp. You do not need a sharp pencil when you're working on, on a paper with this kind of tooth. The other thing is you don't need your colors to be exact. You can adjust your colors later on by essentially doing what we would call a glaze in oil or acrylic painting or watercolor or whatever else. You're going to tint the color after we get this just blocked in. So right now, I'm going to go ahead and blend this out. I'm using a much smaller blending tool there, again, with the powder blender. Now I will spray that. Oh, apparently I'm, I'm not going to. It looks like I'm going to do a couple more layers before I spray. I suspect I sprayed it and paused the video and we just can't see it. Because usually in between every section, I end up spraying. So you're just blocking in some of these darks. I'm even pulling a little bit of black. Now that black won't stay black. I'm going to put browns and other colors on top of it. But I'm, I'm just really worrying about my contrast right now, my values. Make sure that my darks are starting to get dark enough and my light's light enough. That matters more to me than the details and it matters more to me than the color. And even if I'm working in colored pencil or even painting it, no matter what medium I'm working in, I'm going to build the hair up in a very similar way, these clumps and clusters. You can tell this is a part of the live stream because my hand keeps flashing in front of the screen as I was talking to you guys during that. So now I'm going to come through with some highlights. This is a cream pencil. Now the polychromos cream and white show up so well on sanded or gessoed paper. Not so much if you were to work on watercolor paper, the normal hot press that I use. I don't like those pencils, the white and the cream and polychromos on that. They're not opaque enough. They just don't show up. But on a sanded paper or a gessoed paper, they really show up well. So now I'm taking, this is a color called, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but it looks when I read it like Caput Mortium, something like that. This is one of my must-have. I don't have many must-have colors, but this color I use in everything. I can't think of a single project I've not used that color on with the polychromos. I use it on the hair. I use it on face. No matter what skin tone somebody is, it's pretty much guaranteed to be a color I use on the skin tone. Same thing with the hair. Let me go ahead and blend that. See, I'm blending in chunks. I don't want to just blend over everything all because it'll smudge everything together too much. I'm blending each kind of curl, each cluster of of, I wanted to say fur. You know I draw too many animals when I want to call people hair fur. Just blending that out a bit. 
And then I'm going to go ahead and spray that again with the texture fixative, which I apparently cut out of the video. Once that dried, I'm going on to my next layer of details. Now I'm starting to let more of those individual strands show through just a bit. Not all of them. You don't want it to be too many. If you've got too many strands, you end up with hair that looks plastic. Or the other option, if it doesn't look plasticky, it looks like zombie hair, like it's not been washed in a really long time. You don't want too many individual strands showing through. When you look at a person, you're noticing, I mean, look at somebody, if you've got someone in the room with you, look across the room at them. You're noticing the clumps and clusters. You're not noticing each individual strand. So when you try to draw those in, it just doesn't really look right. You only want a few of those to show. What I like to do when I'm drawing anything, well, most things really, but especially with hair, any type of hair, I'm going to look at it as abstract shapes. I'm going to zoom in on my reference photo and just work, look, really look closely at one area at a time and try to copy those abstract shapes. That will make everything, when it all comes together, it will look very realistic, much more so than when you just look at it as the hair as a whole. That tends to get very overwhelming and very often you won't end up with results as accurate as if you had looked at it as abstract shapes and just really copied that reference photo. Now you don't have to copy everything exact on a reference photo, it's just reference, so I will make d changes in color or values as wh whatever I think will make my work look better. But I usually from the start will copy the general shapes pretty closely. Look how much that ivory pencil shows up so well on that paper. This side's mostly in shadow, so I don't have a ton of detail over there. I'm just going to kind of rush through that por portion for the moment. And whenever I'm working, I like to set little mini goals for myself. Like the first night, I wanted to finish the background. My, ne my goal for the next night was the gray portion of her hair. Then the next goal was this section of her hair. But I'll set little goals like this for myself. Instead of just saying, okay, I'm going to go sit down at the easel and work. I'm more likely to get more done if I set these little goals. And I can work longer. I mean, if I hit that goal, if I want to work longer, that's okay. So now you can see the finished photo off to the side there, what I was, where I was going with, with this Beetlejuice-inspired look. And I'm starting on her face. This is the gray, the black and white section. Now, even though I know I'm going to add purple for the makeup around her eyes, that is, which if you've not seen Beetlejuice before, it's a movie from, gosh, was it the 80s, I believe? And it's based off the way that that character looked on this this section here of her face. So I wanted everything to be just black and white and I want to tint the purple over that, but I'm not going to worry about that yet. And the reason that I waited to do the purple until I was done with the rest of her face is I wanted to make sure I had the eyes the exact same. Knowing I was going to pull that purple out so much further than the makeup is on her, the colored portion of her face, I knew that I was going to end up with an illusion where it looked like the eye, the purple side was too big, even though it really wasn't. So I left everything in just black and white, didn't completely ignored where the purple was going to go, just knowing that that would throw up the balance off for me. And I, I would have really ended up with this this eye if I would have done the purple early on. I would have probably made it too small. It wouldn't have matched the other eye because that purple creates the illusion that it's bigger than what it really is, just because it comes out so far. So again, just paying attention to those values. Little details here and there. Remember when you're painting or drawing eyes, the white of the eye is never white. So on this section, it's a gray color. There's no actual white except in the highlight of the eye. The other eye will be the same. It'll be a actually a light flesh color. I think that's the name of the pencil that I used and then I added some white in with it. So we'll start on this side of the face. The first side, the black and white portion, isn't done yet. I've still got to give her some eyelashes and some other things, but I want to go ahead and get this side started just to start balancing things out. 
Now these colors, like doing it one solid color like that, obviously it's very flat, does not look realistic. I'm going to build up to that. Just want to get the white, or in this case it's kind of an off-white color of the paper filled in. Another tip, when you are drawing blue eyes, blue eyes aren't usually blue. In most people, it's going to be gray. So I've used a little bit of blue, but the majority of what I used there was a cool gray. I'm using a lot of different oranges, creams, pinks, reds, lots of different colors in her skin as I build this up. And the color really isn't that big of a deal. I mean, obviously you want to go for close. The thing that is such a big deal, if you're trying to create something that looks realistic, your main focus is really should be your values. Are your lights light enough? Your darks dark enough? And then when you get into the portrait, you do need things to be very accurate. Are the eyes drawn right? Are the no is the nose? If things are just a little bit off, you can completely make the person either look deformed, not look like that person at all, or just simply change the expression. Now, if you're changing the expression because that's what your goal was, that's one thing. But if it's happening because something is drawn off, make sure you get that all of that accurate to begin with. Now the teeth on the inside, her teeth are barely showing there. Look at how it's a dark, dark brownish gray color. It is not white. You're going to be tempted if you're new to portraits. It is so tempting to want to draw teeth white. They're rarely going to be white because they're cast in shadow. That upper lip will normally, on most people, be darker than the lower lip just because of the way that it, it, it tends to be downturned. Now, the light, if you change the light source to where it, it's below the person's face, then that will change things. But on most people, the light is coming from above. So that upper lip is going to be a bit darker than the bottom lip. The bottom lip is going to catch more light. I sprayed that. Use the hairdryer there to rush that along. I was told previously not to use the hairdryer when using the, or spraying, drying the touch, the texture fixative, but I've tried it several times since, and the, the inventor, Aliona Nicholson, who had told me originally that they didn't recommend it, she's been testing it and had, I guess, has had no problems because she's now recommending to go ahead and use the hairdryer too. But I've not had any problems since I started using that to go ahead and dry things off. So I guess it's a use at your own risk because the original theory was, or the thing that I was originally told was that you wanted it to dry more evenly by air, but it, it's been fine. Again, just building up those values. Where are my lights? Where are my darks? And watch that you don't just start putting highlights for the sake of highlights. That's a really big deal. If you do, you will completely make change the look of somebody's face. Watch where the highlights go. Another thing that I strongly recommend people do, watch some videos on contouring, makeup contouring videos on YouTube. There are tons of them out there. If you get a general idea of where women are contouring their face, that gives you a pretty good idea of where you're generally going to want highlights and shadows on a portrait. So if you've got a photo where you don't have good lighting, knowing where those, the contouring typically is can really help in your portrait work. So I just keep layering, keep building until it comes, starts looking more and more like what I want that end result to be. When you draw in the eyelashes, you don't need very many. It's tempting to just want to draw in a hundred little individual strands. It doesn't look right. Look at how the eyelashes will clump and cluster together too. So you'll usually have maybe two or three hairs that group together. They start out white at the base and they clump together at the tips. Watch that on eyelashes. It'll look much more realistic if you do that than if you just draw a whole bunch of random lines in there. Really look at your reference photo. One of the things that's going to make the biggest difference in your work being accurate is you learning to see things accurately. People seem to think that drawing is a hand-eye coordination thing. It really isn't. It's a matter of kind of waking your brain up and forcing it to see what's really there and not what it thinks is there. So really watch your reference or if you're working from a live model, really look at that model. Really look at whatever, whether it be, again, a live model or reference, look at that closely Notice the little changes. Notice where the shadows are, the highlights are. Notice the little lines. So we'll start blocking in her neck. This is the one area that I used black on her face. Uh, well, besides the black and white portion. But in the skin right between her hand and her chin, there is a little bit of black there, but I'm going to layer some of the reddish tones right back over it. 
I'm also going to end up pulling a lot more of the orange tones in here to warm up the colors. Right now on the video, it looks very like a cooler pink. In reality, it's more like what you're seeing on the finished painting there where I've got a lot more of an orangey tone to it. But I can correct that later on. Part is from the camera. Part is because I haven't added a lot of that orange in yet. Now when I start on her clothes, I'm just going to start by blocking them in with black and a cool gray. And then I'll come through and start working on my values, the little creases and, and folds in the fabric. And I'll blend that out. I'm using a smaller blender here. I'll need to spray that with the texture fixative before I do any more detail on that. I'm going to do the same thing, just quickly go through here, block in where my lights and darks go. Notice that my dark, or the lights, the white stripes, they're not white. None of them are. It's all different various shades of gray. Different various shades. That's a little redundant, isn't it? So drawing in her hand, same thing, just kind of blocking in my general lights and darks. It's not very realistic yet. And I shade it in with light flash, just the base color there of her arm too. Start blocking in some of these shadows. And the reason I brought up the black, the only place that I actually added black on her skin was that deep shadow between her hand and her chin. I don't recommend generally using black. Even if you're drawing someone who has a very dark complexion, you're not going to want to use black unless portions are deep, deep in shadow. Normally when you're drawing skin tones, you're gonna to use various browns and orange, red, creams, even blues, purples, a lot of those colors, but black you usually don't wanna jump straight into because it's going to look very, very dull. Of course, like I said, there are exceptions, as I showed here, right in that shadow between her chin and her, her hand there. But normally, that's not going to be a go-to color for shading a portrait. I'm using that ivory for a lot of my highlights here. Now, see how my edges are all very, very fuzzy? I need to make sure that I clean that up by the time I get towards the end of this. Now, this is a mall stick that I'm using here to rest my hand on. It's, it's resting on my easel so that my it's not touching the artwork at all. That way I can rest my hand on that and not on the artwork itself. Normally, I put a piece of glassine under the work that I'm using, but I was jumping around so much and so quickly from one sleeve to the next, it was easy, just easier to grab the mall stick. Usually, that's something that you'll see people use with oil painting, but it worked really well for this. And I'll have a link to the supplies that I'm using in the video description below if you want to check any of those out. So this side, if you look at the dark on her sleeve there, there's just a bit, there's a few little highlights, not too many on that section. And even the white stripes there, look how dark they really are. And I'll, I'll pull out more highlights still, but that you really are going to go very dark. Most of the time when, pe when you're drawing things that are white, they're not normally white, whether it be a flower or an animal, anything. It's other shades. That white is very reflective. It's going to pick up on all of the other shades. You're going to use very, very little straight white in your paintings, at least when you're drawing things realistically. You can have white make, mixed in with other colors, but just straight, straight, like titanium white, that's not a color you're going to use that often. Mainly, it'll be for like the brightest shine highlighted areas, like in this case on her eyes. Now I'm starting to use my white pencil and pull a few highlights out. But see, it's not too many. I'm also using my finger, my pinky there, to do a little bit of that blending. I've got enough layers on the paper that at this stage, it actually blends really well with your fingers. Luckily, it doesn't have that scratchy feel that pastels do. I, I'm not, I, I 
used to, when I used to work in pastels years ago, I used my fingers all the time. And over the years that started to just, I get, it makes me cringe the dryness of that. So I don't like to get pastels on my fingers. This doesn't bother me. It doesn't have that dry chalky feel that soft pastels typically do. Coming back through with the white highlights here. few more on that the sleeve that's really in shade but not too much now i get to start on the green i was so excited to start this part of what i'm using now are polychromos and part are going to be luminance now with the luminance those are wax based if i'm going to have to blend something out with odor or with powder blender i don't want to use a wax based pencil i want to stick with the oil base so in this case the polychromos but here i'm on my final layers i don't need powder blender so it's okay to go ahead and jump over to my wax based pencils so i use both wax and oil based pencils when i'm working with powder blender but if i'm going to blend something Thing with powder blender then i just stick with my oil base and i actually you saw me use a little bit of odorless mineral spirits there too for blending some of the hair you can blend use odorless mineral spirits on sanded paper and with powder blender as long as you have sprayed it with texture fixative between a layer that has powder blender and then the layers that you're going to blend with odorless mineral spirits if you use odorless mineral spirits on an area that the powder blender has not been sealed down it turns into this kind of muddy mess more highlights on our clothing there and it's funny because you look at that and think okay it's black and white but when you really look closely look at all of the values all of the grays in there and i smudged the purple already around her eye now i'm really focusing on my values everything's pretty much in this is just towards the end where i'm making sure those final details are in so here we've got a few of those final strands i talked about where you do want a few of the stray strands of hair showing through over the clothing and over her face so i'm starting to do that i'm using a lot of the wax based pencils the wax based pencils on sanded paper stick really well they don't want to blend that well but when you just want something really bold and opaque they work beautifully and I'm blending a bit with odorless mineral spirits at this point where you see something gets super dark and then it dries lighter. It's because the odorless mineral spirits, when it was wet, looks really dark. There's that odorless mineral spirits again. I don't need a lot of it to blend it out, just smoothing a little bit here and there. When I want these brighter highlights with the white, then the luminance is a really good pencil to go to. The polychromal stands out, but the white is so opaque. Or, I'm sorry, the luminance is so opaque. And the color is very muted on the video. I apologize for that. The part of that, I blame the light that I use. It's a wonderful light. I see everything really well, but it really washes out things on the camera. But you can see on the finished photo what everything actually looks like. One thing I forgot to mention when I did that background that took, I want to say it was about 11 or so layers of colored pencil of adding a layer, blending out, spraying, adding a layer, blending out, spraying. I repeated that process probably around 10, 11 times right around there until I got this to be as dark as I wanted. The nice thing is when you're working on a paper that has this much tooth and then you're using the, the texture fixative that adds more tooth to the paper, you really don't ever hit a point where you can't continuously layer. You're pretty unlikely limited there which is really really nice the bird feeders up on the balcony outside my studio i have not been getting very much work done because i can't stop looking at the tree chickens that are coming to eat they're adorable have you subscribed yet if not i have a handy button right there it's round has an orange arrow going towards it if you click on that that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week but youtube is really bad about notifying people so you may also want to sign up for my email newsletter i send out an update every week of whatever videos went up that week and notify you of any live streams coming up